Early service was uh, normal, but I guess all the hunters and NASCAR fans go to late service. I, what's it? The hunters are still hunting. Yeah, it's opening for a rifle. Yeah, and and that little race where they go in the circle is going on too. So, yeah. Well, and I'd almost be offended that so many people would miss uh, church to do either of those two activities. But I'm reminded I've missed the last two for a football game in Miami and then fishing at the coast last weekend. So I uh, <clears throat> guess we'll just let it slide this time. Um, we are continuing our sermon series on, um, on David. And uh, this morning we take a look at a story of David and Bathsheba and we are reminded that even the, um, the good fall, even the people who, uh, who have a heart for the Lord make mistakes. If you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And 2 Samuel 11 starts off in the spring at the time when kings go off to war. It's kind of an interesting statement if you actually reflect upon it for a second, that it's during the spring that the kings go off to war. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to fight battles in the winter. It's not really comfortable, uh, nor do I imagine fighting them in the middle of the summer. So spring is the time in which kings uh, settle their accounts and go off and do battle. And that's how our story starts uh, with David today. Now, that phrase, kings go off to war, a lot of times the kings would go off in a company and watch the battle from a distance, but uh, at least in this specific situation, David chose not to. So as kings go off to war, that really meant that uh, the, the, the men went off to war, the, the soldiers went off to war, and part of the problem we're going to run into in the story with David and Bathsheba is that the king stayed home and the men went off to battle, leaving their wives behind, and one caught the attention of David. The story continues, David sent Joab, now Joab is David's general. Uh, David sent Joab uh, out with the, the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained behind in Jerusalem. Now one day, uh, or one evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her, and the man said, Isn't she Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So here's David one evening, the, the men are all off in battle, and he's walking to the roof of his palace area, and, and, and he's looking out, and for whatever reason, this woman's bathing on her roof, and it catches his attention. She's exceedingly beautiful, and David knows that, well, the men are off to battle, and this person appears to be of such an age that she probably is married, uh, but, you know, he's not willing to give up hope, so he sends someone to go find out a little information, probably secretly, you know, saying some, some prayers to himself, hoping that somehow she's not married so he could have her uh, as, uh, as his own. Um, but word came back that indeed she is married. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And that should have been enough for David at that point to realize that he should have nothing to do with her. But David um, chose to do otherwise. The story continues. Verse 4. So David sent messengers to go and to get her and she came to him and he slept with her. And she had purified her, uh, herself from her uncleanness, and then she went back home. And the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David finds himself in a little bit of a situation here. This, this woman caught his eye. He, he knew he shouldn't have done uh, what he did, but he brought her, brought her to the palace and he slept with her. And he probably had in his mind, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. I messed up. going to send her home. We're going to pretend like none of this even existed and, and happened and, and, and everything would be okay. But it didn't turn out that way um, because it turns out that she uh, became pregnant. Um, and that created a, a little bit of a problem for David. First of all, it's kind of interesting because David has uh, the either blessing or curse 
depending which way you want to look at it, of having uh, multiple wives and multiple concubines, and, and, uh, and he really has no business being involved with this, this married woman, but now that he has gotten involved with her, now that she's gotten pregnant, he's really put her in jeopardy because she, uh, she certainly could be stoned to death under Jewish law for, uh, for having an affair on her husband, uh, even though it was that she slept with, uh, with the king of Israel. And, and it's a little bit of a PR nightmare for David, if not even more than that, because the people, David was a hero amongst the people. Remember when, uh, when before he was king, uh, when there's still King Saul, the people would shout, uh, Saul's killed the thousands, but David the tens of thousands. Uh, David was a, was a hero in the eyes of the people, and this very much had uh, the ability to tarnish how people saw him. Um, now it appears, though, that... Uh, that David had no, no way out of this kind of situation. But David was resourceful, and he, he has an idea. Let's look at uh, verse 6 and following. So David then goes and he sends word to Joab, his commander, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him, so how's Joab? How are the soldiers doing? How, how, how's the war progressing? Then David went and said to Uriah, You know what? Go down to your house. Wash your feet. Take a load off. Relax. Enjoy a couple days at home. So Uriah left the palace, and, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah didn't go home. In fact, Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all of the master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told that Uriah did not go home. And so David asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. My master, Joab, and my Lord's men, they're camped in open fields. How can I go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. And David said to him, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. David had it all planned out. I'm, I'm going to bring him to the palace. I'm going to act like I'm friends with him. Hey, how's, uh, how's the, the, the general doing? How are the other soldiers doing? Is the war going okay? He kind of makes him out like, you know, hey, he just wants to befriend this neighbor of the palace, right? But... Uriah doesn't fall for what David's trying to do, and it's not really falling for. Uriah is a person of character, and he has values. Uh, even when David, this, this, this man of God who has a heart for God, uh, even as, as he's not showing character and values, he's being deceitful and ways doing, Uriah is just not going to go home. It doesn't seem right to him. If the general's out there fighting and if his fellow troops are sleeping under the open field, he is not going to go home to his wife. He's going to sleep there on the floor uh, in front of the palace, and, um, and just is not going to do what David had intended for him to do. The situation complicates then a little bit for David. And it looks like David, once again, has no way out, but David comes up with uh, another plan. He says in verse 12, uh, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I'll send you back. And so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And now at David's invitation, he ate and he drank with him. In fact, David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat amongst his master's servants, and he did not go home again. Here's David thinking, you know what? Introduce a little alcohol to the equation. And for anyone who's ever drank, you know that uh, certainly the more you drink, the less your, uh, uh, less your inhibitions are. Even if you have values, even if you have principles, they're more likely to, to waver just a bit once you've uh, been drinking, especially to the point of being drunk. So David gets him drunk. He's acting like he's friends with this guy or he's supportive of this guy in the attempt that then he'll go home to his wife. But even after being drunk, even after uh, you know having uh, been more susceptible to the desires of the flesh or to be able to go home and to, to sleep in his own bed or to be with his wife, um, Uriah still chooses not to do it. And now David's got even a bigger problem. But David's got another idea. So it says in verse 14, So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab 
and he sent it with Uriah. And in it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is the fiercest, and then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a high place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent, Joab sent David a full account of the battle, and he instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the, the king the account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know that they'd shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerob uh, Besheth? Best didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? And it, if the king happens to ask you this, then say to him, Oh, also your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything that Joab had sent him to say. And the messenger said to David, The men overpowered us, and they came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance to the city gate. The archer shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Now David told the messenger, Say this to Joab. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as the other. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. And when Uriah's wife had heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought back to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done had displeased the Lord. Now, there's some interesting things going on in that last section of that story. Uh, one is the kind of the relationship that David and his general has. The general kind of uses this situation uh, to accomplish what he desires even more than David, uh, trying to really pressure the uh, the, the, the city, and he puts more people at risk than just Uriah. And when he sends a messenger with the news, he's like, if the king gets a little upset that so many people died, oh, just tell him, by the way, Uriah is dead. Because he knew that would kind of appease the king's anger. And that's exactly what happens. David's like, oh, you know, hey, you know, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, you know, tell, tell the general, don't worry, good job, take over, the, you know, take the city. The other thing that's interesting there, though, in that conversation or in that, that, that part, that, that section of the text, it says in verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In that letter to his general was, kill Uriah. And here's Uriah who thinks the king's being nice to him for some reason, being neighborly. We live in the neighborhood. The king calls me back from bat battle. He's sending gifts to my house. He, um, he uh, invites me to dine with him. He gives me some of his choice wine. And, and, and oh, yes, king, the message, you got it. I'll take it to the general. And, and, and with pride and with uh, confidence in what he's doing for his king and, 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 and country, he takes it to the general. The whole time he's, he's carrying the... Um, uh, the, the gun that will be used in the firing squad. He's carrying the death sentence from the king that's betraying him and stabbing him in the back. It's kind of also interesting that at the end of that section there, um, it says that when Bathsheba found out that her husband was dead, uh, she mourned for him. And that after the time of mourning was over, David uh, took her to be his wife. I, I wonder if Bathsheba knew what David was doing. I wonder if, you know, when, uh, when, when, when David brought uh, Uriah home, because it seemed to, seemed to be at least that David brought Uriah home so that he'd sleep with his wife and that that could be the excuse of why Bathsheba was pregnant, and then this would kind of just maybe be a dirty secret of just a couple different people. It, 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 and, and so, at least on the surface, it seems like David wasn't necessarily trying to harm Bathsheba's husband. But I, I can't help but wonder if he tells Bathsheba, you know, Bathsheba, um, the Lord kind of takes care of things. And unfortunately, your, your husband was killed in battle, but don't worry, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to take care of, uh, of the child. Or I wonder if she knew that David uh, had arranged all of this so that he would... Uh, he would be killed, that, ba that David basically killed her husband. Scripture doesn't really make that clear, but kind of an interesting question, I think, as we, we read that text.
Well, there's a a few things that I want to kind of point out about the story that we just read that I think we ought to be able to make some application to our lives. The first is this. Good people make mistakes, okay? The Scripture says of David, he had a he had a heart for the Lord. He's acting like a he's acting like a creep. He's acting like a really um, bad slash almost evil person at this point, right? Good people make mistakes, but here's the deal: we live in a world today in which good people aren't allowed to make mistakes. In fact, it's quite frustrating because we expect mistakes from from the bad people, right? Um, whether it be that. Uh, New York congressman or whoever it was, Anthony Weiner, remember, he sent those pictures of himself to, to women. Uh, I think he resigned from office. Then he decided to run for office again, and uh, he was actually doing really well until uh, it came out that he was still doing the same stuff. But someone like that, people are like ready to embrace him. Oh, you know, victim of something in childhood or something. Um, I, I can even think of like, especially it seems like Dallas County, uh, the, 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 the county commissioners and stuff like that. It's almost a prerequisite that you be under an investigation by the FBI to be elected. You know, they, they, they keep get, you know, bringing these people in. It's completely okay that, that they're crooks and that they mess up their, 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 their R crook, right? But when it comes to good people, when it comes to godly people, when it comes to what society would consider people who, who, who are men of God or women of God or righteous type people, there is no tolerance for mistakes. That's why, you know, when Tebow was in the NFL, there was all this media attention because he was someone who claimed to have faith. Uh, people were jealous of him because he lived by a set of standards that they thought made him feel like he was better than, than, than other people when he wouldn't have said that at all. And so they're sitting there and they're just waiting for him to make a mistake because as soon as he would, they'd pounce on him. The same thing can be said for, you know, people who are pastors or, or anyone that uh, has any kind of standing in, 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 in the Christian setting. Um, society, the media, whoever, they're waiting there to pounce on them, to devour them, to, um, to, to just use that to discredit Christianity altogether. But the Bible is clear and shows us that good people make mistakes. Even David did. The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're fooling ourselves and God's truth is not in us. That yes, the, 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 the unrighteous people may be wicked a whole lot more of the time, but even the good people are going to mess up and we can't put them on a pedestal because everyone's going to mess up. For, for all of us, no matter how, how righteous we are, no matter how devoted we are to our faith, all of us in here uh, have no choice but to rely on the blood of Christ to atone for our sins and to uh, cover up where we fall short because we will all fall short and we need to remember that when good people make mistakes, all people do and good people will as well. The second thing that we need to kind of pick up from this is that... Um, Covering up your mistakes oftentimes multiplies them. You know, David did a bad thing, and it would have been really interesting. I wonder how the story would have progressed and ended if David had just right from the beginning, because certainly some people knew about this. David didn't go down to the house. He had some servants go down to the house. He was asking some people, who is this? You know, he might have had to let the general in on a little bit of this background knowledge so he can explain why he's bringing Uriah back and then why he's wanting to get him killed. And You know, some people kind of knew some stuff was going on here. I wonder what would have happened if David had just submitted it, but he wouldn't admit it. In fact, he tried to cover it up. And by covering it up, then he goes and he, you know, he, he, he gets Uriah drunk, which isn't a good thing. Uh, by covering it up, then he goes and really is responsible for murder then. Uh, he in his mind tries to, to, to clear his conscience saying, I'm not killing him. Hey, he's just dying in battle. But don't, you know, don't misunderstand. David killed Uriah. And so it is with us. We need to not try to cover up our mistakes. We need to acknowledge them. It's a lot better for us if we just simply acknowledge them. But so oftentimes, we don't want to admit we're wrong. We don't want to admit we, we, we've sinned. We uh, try to blame other people for our own sin. And, uh, and when we do that, sin becomes like a cancer. Okay? Cancer, if you, if you refuse to acknowledge it's there, if you don't treat it aggressively from the start, it will get worse and worse and worse and deadly and more deadly. But it must be attacked and it must be attacked hard from the beginning. And so it should be with us, with our own sin. The third thing that we uh, need to take from this is that there's certainly punishment that, that results from sin. Um, 
if you're not familiar with how this story ends, let's, let's go here to 2 Samuel 12 and read a few verses in that. Now the Lord, after this happened, it said in our last chapter, the Lord wasn't real thrilled with what had happened here. So Lord, the Lord sends Nathan to David. Now Nathan is like the prophet of the day. He's like the head prophet over Israel, the one that, you know, is over the spiritual well-being of the, the nation of Israel. So the Lord sends Nathan to David, and when Nathan comes to David, he, he tells David the story. He says, there are two men in a certain town. Now one of the men were rich, and the other one was poor. Now the rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man, he had nothing except this one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, it grew up with him and his children, it even shared his food, it drank from his cup, it even slept in his arms, it was like a daughter to him. Now this traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, and he prepared it for the one who had come to him. David was a person who had the strong understanding of right and wrong, so he burned with anger, a righteous anger, then against the man. And he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you're the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have even given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me, and you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I'm going to take your wives and I'm going to give them to one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight for what you did in secret. I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. And then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're going to, you are not going to die. But because that by doing this you have made enemies of the Lord, show utter contempt. The son that is born to you will die. Now when you read that, some of you are out there like, wow, how cruel of the Lord to kill this kid because of what David had done. But I'm here to tell you that when I look at this, I'm like, wow, how forgiving is God? You know, here's David, you know, committing murder and adultery and all these things. They, you know, Bathsheba could have been killed for this. David certainly should have uh, been killed or dethroned from, from this. But the Lord says, your sins are forgiven. I take away your guilt. And he shows forgiveness to David. But showing forgiveness is not the same as, as not having to pay a price for the sin. Now, you and I know that Jesus has paid the price for our sin. You, you and I know that the ultimate price has been paid on that cross, and where we fall short, Christ has paid that in full, and we have eternal life. But nonetheless, when we sin, when we fail, when we make stupid mistakes, there is consequences for our actions. And though we are forgiven by the Lord, it does not mean that you and I will not have to face consequences, for we will, because there's consequences associated with breaking the law of God. I guess you can think of it even in terms of the punishment of your own children. Your children, when they misbehave, are punished, but that does not mean that you don't forgive them and love them. Which leads us then nicely into our last point there. Um, there is forgiveness in the heart of God, even for a murderer. Now, it's kind of interesting when we talk about sin, 
this is, murder is usually one of the things that we kind of like to draw the line when you talk to people, you know, this person who committed this murder that you heard on, on television, do you think that they could be in heaven? And most of, most of us get pretty repulsed by that and don't want to have a part in heaven if indeed murderers like that can get to heaven. But the reality is, is God's forgiveness is so great that even to a murderer can be forgiven. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have to say I struggle sometimes with the depth and the breadth of the forgiveness of God. You know, the Bible talks about it as far as east is from the west, God removes our sins. But at least it seems in my mind there's just certain things that, that would be really hard to be forgiven of. And so I don't know if you're like me, we probably all, um, we probably all uh, come in here today with certain things in our heart, in our mind, on our conscience that we think, you know what, that's not going to work out real well for us someday. Maybe for some of us in here, it's, um, it's the thoughts we have of other people. You know, we can be really mean. We can be very judgmental. You know, you look at people and you kind of pick them apart or you make fun of them uh, to your friends or something like that. Maybe it's the words that come out of our mouths. Maybe we have propensity to gossip or to not speak nice to other, others. Maybe it's, maybe it's the, the, the emotions, you know, that we carry in our heart, um, the guilt that we carry on our hands or, or our feet for something that we've done. Um, maybe some of us in here, uh, as David, have committed adultery, and we just, um, we know that that's, that's going to hurt one day, um, that we, we can't forgive ourselves for that. Maybe some of us in here have committed murder. Maybe some of us in here um, have, uh, have had abortions. You know, we like to call them procedures, but let's be real about it. Uh, it's murder. And so we have these things that are in our mind that we cannot forgive ourselves of. It, 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 and they, it depresses us when we think about it. It wears us down. But, but the thing that we, we have to acknowledge is for those who, who want the forgiveness of God, for those who are, who are children of God, for those who, who, who love God, there is this incredible mercy and forgiveness that's extended to us that surpasses our ability to even fathom that God can forgive us of the things that I've told you. How do I know? Well, the Scripture declares it. But even more than that, you've got David who committed adultery who committed murder and in essence was almost the same as you know either an abortion or killing his newborn baby because of his actions can you imagine the guilt he had to carry with him but the prophet Nathan said to him the Lord has taken away your sin Don't know what we carry with us, the guilt of things in the past, maybe the guilt of things going on in the present. But the Lord calls out to us, your sins are forgiven in the same way that David's were forgiven. Because the mercy of God, um, is, there's no end to it. There is no way to, to do a sin that God cannot forgive for those who love him and for those who are his children. Because don't get me wrong, you have to be a believer in God. You've got to be uh, sorry for your sin. But when you are, God is there, and the blood of Jesus Christ atones us for whatever it is that we carry with us into this place today and anything that might happen in the future. So we reflect upon the story of David be ever mindful of the fact that good people make mistakes, good people sin. Forgive yourself for your sin. Forgive the people around you who are sin because we all make mistakes. And find that peace that passes understanding in realizing that whatever the sin that you carry on your own hands, Christ has taken on his back on that cross for all of us. To join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Almighty God, we thank you for the story of David and we pray that we would be forgiving people, forgiving of others that sin against us and be forgiving of ourselves. As I think all of us carry around certain burdens that in our heart of hearts we struggle with forgiving ourselves for. Help us to remember, gracious God, the forgiveness of, that was offered David. 
Help us by your spirit to be assured of the forgiveness given us so that we might be able to hand that burden over to you and feel that, um, that amazing peace that is only found in the, in the cross and the empty tomb of Christ Jesus. We pray this in, in Jesus' name. Amen.